Awesome. All right. I think we can get into it here. Um, so thanks everyone uh, for being here today for this episode of Fur Radio. So I'm joined today uh, from Daniel from Arbitrum. So super happy to have you here today, uh, Daniel. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. So um, yeah, so if you're unaware about what Fru Combo is or you're just hearing about us, um, we are a DeFi um, kind of aggregator that allows you to chain together transactions um, and kind of manage your funds or do swaps and execute it all within uh, one transaction. So we did launch on Arbitrum a couple months ago. So if you haven't check, checked us out yet, definitely do that. Um, one of our more famous features is the, the flash loan to kind of manage your liquidity on Aave. So that's our uh, biggest use case right now. And we have uh, three platforms available in Arbitrum, Paraswap, Uniswap, and Aave. So yeah, uh, of course, if you have any questions, you can reach us in the chat as well. But uh, today we're going to be learning a little bit more about, um, you know, Arbitrum. What's the plan for Arbitrum in the future? How does Arbitrum fit into, you know, the, the sea of all these networks and kind of what is, you know, scalability look like? What is a layer two? All that kind of stuff. So definitely interested to get into that. Um, Daniel, maybe you just want to kind of introduce yourself first, um, how you got into crypto, how you started working for Arbitrum and, uh, yeah, we can start from there. Uh, sure. So, um, yeah, hello. And thanks again for having me. Uh, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm normally on Twitter at dzac 23 but I seem to be blocked out temporarily. So here I am from the Arbitrum account. Um, so be it. <laughs> um, in terms of, uh, yeah, I guess maybe just a bit about me first, but I had, um, I've been in the crypto space generally for a little while and for a bit was kind of um, working uh, independently and in the sort of like L2 research space, um, which is how I found um, the Off-Chain Labs team uh, working on Arbitrum. So I'm not a founder, but I joined, you know, it was one of the early employees. I've been, been around, uh, been at Off-Chain Labs since the beginning of 2020, more or less. <laughs> And um, yeah, I do sort of um, a combination of some some engineering stuff, um, like at the smart contract level, uh, as well as kind of like technical uh, technical content and research and uh, and things things of that nature. Awesome, awesome. No, that sounds great. Well, glad to have you here. Um, cool. So I think we can kind of just get right into it. You know, um, mm -hmm. can you help? You know, people that aren't familiar with Arbitrum, kind of understand, you know, what you guys are looking to achieve and maybe how, how things are kind of different with Arbitrum when compared to, uh, you know, a traditional um, proof of stake network, such as uh, like a Polygon or what people are used to today. Like how, how are layer two starting to differentiate between, uh, you know, a previous generation of network? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess to start, and I, I assume a lot of people have, have some familiarity with this stuff, but just to give a general overview, um, you know, the, the basic problem that uh, that Arbitrum and platforms like Arbitrum is, are, are trying to solve here is um, Ethereum scalability bottleneck, which is to say that Ethereum can only handle a pretty limited amount of activity before uh, it starts to get very expensive to use in terms of transaction fees. So Arbitrum is a platform where you can sort of uh, use Ethereum, but in a way that's much uh, cheaper and also faster. Um, the basic principle of, um, of Arbitrum Rollup, which is kind of the core, uh, sort of our flagship product, we have sort of a suite of technologies, but I'll, I'll mostly talk about Arbitrum Rollup. Um, so the idea here, it's sort of, um, it's a layer two, which means it's, it's the separate environment. You can kind of if you have assets or things like that on Ethereum, you can move them over into an Arbitrum chain. While it's in that environment, you can interact again uh, for much lower fees and much faster, and then you can kind of bridge back whenever you want. Um, the key property with Arbitrum Rollup is that even though it's this, you know, quote unquote separate environment and it's and it's cheaper and faster, it's sort of designed so that it can inherit the same security properties of Ethereum itself. Um, so in terms of yeah, differentiating with things like proof of stake side chains or um, federated side chains and things like that, those those kind of introduce some new trust assumption, some new security assumption, um, which is sort of how they get their scalability. The idea, the sort of starting point with Arbitrum Rollup is, okay, how do we um, keep the thing trustless uh, and then sort of optimize from there? Um, and then, yeah, maybe just a little bit more color on, how, on what that looks like um, is the 
sort of the way that we're able to lower fees is instead of actually processing every transaction directly on layer one on Ethereum, we, there's this notion of optimistic execution. So you say sort of um, you only kind of do the work on Ethereum if you absolutely need to. But in the sort of happy common case, you kind of do the actual work of processing transactions in the separate environment on layer two. And then only if something invalid happens, if someone wants to challenge, do you sort of have this recourse to go back to layer one. Um, and um, yeah, the key property is basically anybody can anybody can monitor it. So anybody can watch for anything invalid going on. Um, and in principle, anybody can sort of um, participate and do one of these uh, what we call disputes or fraud proofs and uh, ensure that, you know, everything is valid. Um, I say in principle, uh, well, for reasons that maybe I'll, I'll get into later, but there's a, a very high level overview. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. It's, uh, you know, maybe kind of confusing to a first listener, but I think that's a good, uh, good a overview. Stuff, I know, but yeah, 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 yeah but definitely. I can do it in a minute or two. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that works. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious on my end, has there any bit, uh, has there been a challenge yet uh, on the optimistic side on a, a fraudulent transaction yet? Um, there has not. Um, and, you know, the idea... Um, ideally, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. I think the founders said this the first time I spoke to them is they're like, you know, as they were demonstrating what they had already implemented, they're like, you know, the idea is, they said something like the idea is we're building this stuff so that we can use it in, you know, like in demonstrations and during talks. <laughs> um, but ideally you should never have to use it, right? Essentially, if it's, you know, if the security system indeed works and it indeed is sound, um, there's no reason it should ever have to be used in particular, because, you know, if a challenge occurs, um, sort of in order to participate, uh, so in order to make what we call assertions, which is sort of like advancing the state of Arbitrum, and then also to, to challenge it and help resolve, you have to have some, um, like a, a bond locked up, so some ether, and the loser of the challenge is gonna forfeit their bond, so they kind of get slashed. Um, and you know, if indeed it works and it's sound and there's no bugs, et cetera, you're sort of guaranteed to get slashed if you do an invalid, uh, an invalid stage of this. So, so, so to even challenge something, to even propose something invalid is sort of like provably costly. So the idea is why bother. Um, so, so yeah, ideally it's like the system that you need, but if it works, you shouldn't ever have to use it. Um, I should also say that, you know, the reason I say like in principle, it's designed um, um, such that anybody can, uh, can challenge and submit prob, uh, fraud proofs and so on. Um, so in, in the current state, we sort of have the full implementation. It's fully implemented uh, and it's all running on, uh, you know, it's all there on mainnet. So the full system for uh, running a validator, proving fraud, et cetera. The actual list of parties that can that can be validators, which are the parties that can participate, um, is it's currently under a whitelist. Um, and one of the things that we're moving towards is, um, in various ways, kind of you know progressively decentralizing the system. And and that's a key. That's going to be a key piece. Is 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 list is lifting that whitelist so that you know it's not just permissionless in principle, but in actual fact, anyone can participate. Um, and there's, uh, yeah, I'll talk a bit later about the sort of a big step that will take us to a point where we can, where we can do that. Uh, yeah, but, but yeah, so I, I bring that up because, you know, that's part of why, because it's a set of about, about a dozen whitelisted entities, um, you know, um, and, you know, we know who they are, so we don't expect a challenge to, to emerge from them. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, I think that makes sense. Uh, Perfect. So yeah, I think we, we spoke a little bit about how the consensus mechanism works. So if someone wants to, I guess, just get mm -hmm. involved in the validation of, um, of the network, um, is that free and open to anyone or? Yeah. So, uh, well, yeah, I'd say a few things. So first, in, in terms of, um, I, I kind of use the word consensus mechanism. What we typically say, and I think it's the right way to think about it, is like Arbitrum itself, the Arbitrum rollup doesn't really have its own consensus mechanism it kind of just inherits consensus from Ethereum, right? So uh, again, unlike a proof of stake sidechain where, you know, there's there's some set of stakers, they have some, let's say some token staked or whatever, they have to come to consensus on the state of the chain. There's nothing like that. It's basically the state of the Arbitrum chain is enforced directly from Ethereum. And yeah, as long as there's just like one, just at minimum one honest validator who's there just in case they need to dispute, um, we can predict exactly what the state will be. So. Um, so yeah, so we kind of have, we sort of prefer to say there's no consensus mechanism or, or, you know, it inherits consensus directly. Um, in terms of, in terms of running nodes, so, you know, um, the, because it's a roll up, all of the chain data is, uh, is there on Ethereum, which means it's, you know, publicly available for the world. Um, so anybody can run the Arbitrum software 
uh, the sort of latest and greatest version of the software we call Nitro. Anybody can run a Nitro node, just like anyone can run an Ethereum node. You can reconstruct the state of Arbitrum um, and and uh, and monitor exactly what's going on. Um, uh, you're also in a permissionless way. You can sort of check for any of these challenges. Um, that's all. That's all public. Um, in terms of active participation, that's the that's the part where that is uh, is still under is, is still under a whitelist. Um, which uh, uh, yeah, we'll be opening that up. Um, well, we'll have more to say about that very soon. Okay, sounds good. No, that definitely makes sense. Um... Yeah, so if someone wants to jump onto Arbitrum or get involved, I think it's pretty widely spread now. There's quite a few bridges uh, you can use. Mm -hmm. um, you can even use, uh, there's many centralized exchanges as well where you can transfer read to Arbitrum. Um, so I think in terms of getting onto Arbitrum, I think it's fairly easy. Of course, there's the, the, the I guess, the natural bridge as well. Um, which you can do right from the website. Um, uh -huh. I guess the one thing to mention on that is there's some, is there a time limit when you're leaving the network on the standard bridge? Yeah. So if you're going through, so basically the nature of, like I said, you know, the security of, of, uh, of optimistic rollups like Arbitrum comes from this, this ability to dispute, um, to sort of claim and then prove that fraud, fraud is committed. So basically, it, it, sort of inherent in the system is you have to give time for that process to happen, right? You have to give this window of time where anybody who wants to dispute can. So what that means is, yeah, as you say, if you're sort of withdrawing, if you're, if you're sort of sending a message from layer two down to layer one, the most common and important type is like withdrawing assets from layer two to layer one. That's where you have to wait for the dispute period to resolve before you can kind of like claim your assets on layer one. So that dispute period is, is a week. Um, what I should say, though, is that that is if you're, and I, I think you sort of said this in your question, that's if you're using sort of Arbitrum's native bridge. So that's the that's just sort of necessary that there has to be a native bridge and there, it has to have that dispute period built in. Um, but at this point, you know, there there's a pretty wide ecosystem of of other bridges that kind of build, you know, these application level bridges that build on top of chains, um, many of which uh, let you just bypass that dispute period altogether. Um, and we sort of, you know, our current, you know, our current trade-off here is, you know, given that these are third parties and, you know, we, we, we want to be careful, but sort of on our, on our actual bridge page, we sort of link to those. We say, if you want to use another bridge, you know, do your own research, um, but, um, but here's other options. And of those other bridges, I'll just say, you know, some of them, the reason they're able to bypass the seven-day period in some cases is because they just sort of introduce their own, their own security assumptions, their own security mechanism, let's say. Um, but, um, there also are, you know, there are a few bridges out there that meant that, you know, offer this, uh, in sort of a trustless way. So, um, an example would be Connext. I'll just name them because I think what they're doing is, um, is very cool here where using the Connext bridge itself is not introducing additional trust assumptions. Um, I think Hop as well is, is, is sort of in that category. It's maybe slightly more complicated, but, um, but yeah, we're a big fan of like trustless bridges that lets us, uh, you know, from user perspective, you don't have to experience that seven-day delay, uh, but you're not you're not trusting an additional third party. Um, but if you're if you're okay with trusting third parties or trusting some other security mechanism, yeah, there's there's a plethora of other options as well. For sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I know it's yeah. cool that it introduces some benefit uh, over the you know the standard bridge. Um, yeah, we're, so we, yeah, we were you know, and 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 I'll just say you know when we were first first launching and so on, we considered sort of offering that support ourselves of having these, what we call like fast exits or liquidity exit. We sort of mm -hmm. settled on like, you know, we have enough, like we have enough to do basically. Um, <laughs> so, and you know, we don't want to add work for ourselves and we have enough. And also we don't want to like ourselves, you know, it just spreads us thinner, adds additional risk and things like that. But we were very happy to see that this huge ecosystem of bridges emerged, you know, very quickly, you know, most of these bridges didn't exist not that not that long ago. So yeah, we're very happy about the fact that we can we can point to others. Um, it does get confusing for everyone, especially users, when there's all of these options there and making sense of it. But I think like the best resource here is probably L2 Beat for those who aren't familiar. Um, so they started out as a as a web, you know um, this sort of independent research group tracking the different layer twos, the different states of decentralization, the security assumptions and so on. And now uh, a few months ago, I think they revealed like a bridge page. So I, I generally just direct people there and say, if you want to start deep diving into what bridges to use and what the implications are, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a, good, a good place to start and perhaps end. 
Oh, interesting. Yeah, I just, uh, I'm actually on there right now. Uh, so mm -hmm. I didn't realize there was a bridge page. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's um, pretty great. It's pretty, <laughs> it was pretty necessary. And honestly, you know, there's a lot of, it's, there's a lot to unpack in there. Um, and there's all sorts of, you know, crypto, you know, us crypto researchers, we like to nitpick and debate everything, but I think they did a very good job. So, yeah. Nice. Well, I'll personally check that out. Uh, that's cool. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, and the fees are quite low, which is nice on all these uh, bridges and, um, mm -hmm. you know, to help with the, I guess, the confusion, you can always use uh, LiFi, which is a bridge aggregator. So that that also mm -hmm. helps. I, I send people there to kind of help to streamline. But again, you do have to be aware of the trust assumptions, as you mentioned. Um, so no, that's interesting. Um, cool. I just wanted to jump in quick. I know you guys recently launched, well, I think six months ago, maybe less, another network called Arbitrum Nova. So how is that different from mm. Arbitrum One? Yeah, um, good question. So the, um, yeah, so as you say, the first thing to understand is Arbitrum Nova is, so Arbitrum One is like the roll-up, the big uh, Arbitrum roll-up chain, our, flag, our, our flagship product that has the, you know, um, has the design and security assumptions that I was describing earlier. Um, Arbitrum Nova is a, is a totally separate chain, um, also kind of lives on top of Ethereum. And um, what's interesting is that actually, if you sort of, you know, if you're a developer and you, and you want to dig around into the implementation and the contracts and so on, um, a lot of, it shares a lot of the same um, code architecture as Arbitrum 1. Like we've, most of the code is literally reused. Um, the key difference, it, 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 it's sort of um, Arbitrum Nova makes a different trade-off um, in terms of uh, on the sort of security fees spectrum. <laughs> so... Um, with again with Arbitrum Rollup, it's all about let's build something that's trustless. What we find with rollups, uh, at least currently, this might change, but um, currently what we see is that you know one of the requirements of any rollup is that data is posted on layer one. So we're sort of using layer one Ethereum for for, uh, for data availability essentially, and then we sort of do execution on layer two. And what we find is that um, when it comes to the fees that users are actually paying the majority of it is paying for that layer one data. Um, so if we want to create a, an, an alternative system to decrease fees, that's kind of the, the key thing to attack. So the idea of Nova is we say, okay, we're going to have a system that kind of works very similar to something like an Arbitrum rollup, except instead of using Ethereum for data availability, we introduce this thing called a data availability committee. And um, this committee is responsible for maintaining the data. Um, so instead of posting it on Ethereum, we give it to this committee. That makes it a lot cheaper. Um, what this also means is there, there is a bit of a trust assumption in that committee. And we sort of, the way, uh, you know, compared to other sidechain designs and things like that, the trade-off here is we want to sort of, it, so it is a trust assumption to be clear, so that, you know, we want to be clear about that, but we want to sort of minimize it as much as possible. And essentially, the idea is there is there is this committee, and the, the trust assumption here in the case of Arbitrum Nova is that um, the as long as there are two honest members of the committee, you you will be safe. Which means on the other side of that, if the entire committee, so all, or if all but one of them um, collude together, um, you know they can they can sort of uh, compromise the safety of the chain. But if that doesn't happen, um, uh, your funds will be safe. So so a slight security trade off or a slight trust trade-off, but the benefit is you get uh, pretty significantly lower fees. And yeah, the idea is, you know, people, uh, users, developers, they can they can just sort of pick whatever whatever suits their needs. Um, so we tend to say for Nova, for the sorts of applications that, the sorts of Web3 applications that aren't, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, aren't so much focused on um, ownership of financial assets, but rather, but involve a lot of data. So things like uh, certain gaming applications, uh, certain uses of like blockchain for social media, things like this. For stuff like that, Nova might make sense because you don't necessarily need this, that same bar of tight security, um, but you still want to, you know, sort of be in the Web3 world, be able to use Web3 wallets and tooling and use the ecosystem, right? So there's there's a reason you want to be on a blockchain still. Um, that's where that's where Nova makes sense. Whereas for, you know, high value DeFi stuff and things like that, we think rollups probably, uh, you know, you get the roll-up level security, but again, we have both, and you can you can sort of pick your pick your poison. Perfect. No, I think that's a that's a great explanation. Um, I think Reddit is part of Arbitrum Nova now, or other kind of gaming. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. So Reddit, um, uh, Reddit's been involved um, since pretty early on. They have this uh, this community points initiative, so that's running uh, running on our Richmond Nova. And uh, uh, yeah, this is mm-hmm. something we're gonna uh, we're increasingly pushing and trying and trying to expand, as well as you know we're starting to think about you know what uh, sort of a broader multi chain Arbitrum ecosystem might look like of more uh, additional chains like Nova or like Arbitrum One and how they'll interact. Uh, yeah, this is sort of where our head's at. Gotcha. So who's part of, or who are the big players in the committee uh, right now for Nova? Sure. I don't want to, I, I want to pull up the list so I'd get it right and not forget anyone. <laughs> um, um, but give me one second. <laughs> uh, but essentially, you know, it's a mix of um, what we wanted to do and what I think we, we, we managed to do nicely is it's a mix of kind of web two, um, um, uh, as well as Web3 entities. So uh, so we ourselves are mm-hmm. members of the committee, of course. Um, we uh, Reddit, like I said, is on board. Uh, mm-hmm. Quicknode um, is, 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 is part of that. P2P, Consensus, uh, yeah, and I think a few others, but that gives you sort of a taste. So yeah, right. for something like this, obviously, you want, you want independent parties because um, we want to sort of minimize any risk of, of collusion and also independent, but, you know, um, that themselves have a nice, trusted, good reputation. And uh, yeah, again, you can assess as a user for yourself what the what the sort of risks are there. But um, but yeah, given that these are uh, you know these parties are on board um, and, and and independent, we think that the the violation of the trust assumption isn't something that's highly likely. So yeah, gotcha, gotcha. So like, I, I guess you guys probably try to bring on people that have some stake in the network as well. Like you know, Reddit's running their chain or their transactions through there, so they're you know, they have some incentive to be an honest validator or an honest yeah. uh, committee member. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's also that's also beneficial. And, you know, consensus, we have all sorts of working relationships and partnerships with them. So it's just sort of in the in the broader, you know, in the in the broader scheme of things, it's like it's in their it's it's in their interest to see Arbitrum succeed. So so, yeah, mm-hmm. to have a, a soft stake in the network is also is also a good thing. But also, yeah, you know, having having sort of um some of the parties you may not expect from the web two world is a, uh, is a positive thing. Cool. Yeah, no, I like that, that diversity that, that definitely helps. Um, awesome. So uh, that's Nova and a little bit on Arbitrum one. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, and again, that, that just, sorry, but just to, just to wrap up. So that, yeah. that committee yeah, I'm no talking about, that's, that's strictly the, the data availability ability committee strictly for Arbitrum Nova. So our uh, Arbitrum one has no no notion of anything like that. There's no uh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Just to be clear. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. No. For sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. You didn't say anything. So I just want to make. I I just want to make. Sure. I, I, I make sure. <laughs> yeah. No. That's okay. fine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind at all. Yeah. Definitely make it as clear as possible. So, um, yeah. Just to make that dif- differentiation. That's good. Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of the, I guess the future of Ethereum, um, I guess we can bundle these two questions. You know, I think we talked a bit about how you guys fit in, but like in terms of the future of interoperability, you know, how do you see maybe these rollups communicating or, or once scaling happens, how does kind of everything fit in together and, you know, what does the future of Ethereum look like? I mean, that's kind of a loaded question. Um, Uh, that's, um, but. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fair question though. Yeah, I think yeah, interoperability is a, is, is is sort of a hot topic and a complex topic. Generally speaking, I think um, what we will see or what we sort of want to see is that you know in a way, what what what's entailed by by and but by interoperability, yeah, as you say, we mean sort of being able to cross communicate between chains. So one the, the sort of um, bread and butter example of this is like moving your assets between chain A and chain B. Um, uh, whatever those chains might be, maybe they're maybe it's L1 to L2 between two different L2s, uh, um, you know, and so on uh, between two different L1s. Um, but there's you know mm-hmm. more general cross chain communication where you have like you know you can imagine um, uh, sort of a DAP that sort that that has components on multiple different chains, and as a user you're just sort of seamlessly making cross chain contract calls between them and things like that. Um, this is something that um, many projects are thinking about. And I think what inevitably will happen is it, it, it actually is going to get sort of under the hood more complex over time, just because there's a lot of, you know, in short, because there's more and more different types of chains, right? So there's how, um, 
how how easy it is to to do these sort of cross chain communication depends on a number of things. So like if you know, first if a chain is EVM compatible, which I said I maybe didn't even mention that, but Arbitrum that's one of the key the key things. We're fully fully Ethereum compatible or EVM compatible. Um, so so you know, there's uh, sort of as minimal of a difference as possible um, between using Arbitrum and using Ethereum from like a developer perspective. So chains like that, if you have you know two EVM compatible chains, that that um, gives you an advantage for sort of bridging or, 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 or interopering between them in that they can sort of, you know, bridge, uh, you know, bridge applications can kind of design universal interfaces. We can, we can sort of reuse tooling. We can sort of have the same expectations on both ends if that, if that makes sense. Um, but, um, yeah, other factors are, you know, different chains have different fee structures. That's a thing to consider. Um, whether a chain, you know, two L2s of the same L1 <laughs> um, in that particular situation, like, you know, two different Ethereum layer twos, there's certain advantages there. The fact that they're both settled to the same layer one, so you can sort of have some superpowers in your cross-chain uh, cross communication. But, but yeah, there's also chains that, are, that use totally different non-Ethereum, non-EVM data models. There's already things like Solana, and, you know, there'll be uh, projects like Fuel, which is a layer two that has its own separate data model. So, um, and then all these ZK, you know, ZK EVMs and things like that. So the more, the more diversity of chains emerges, the more we have to sort of, it, it becomes harder to, to coordinate these things is the sort of, I guess, bad news. The good news, I think, is more and more what I think we, what I hope to see is that this complexity from a user perspective just gets abstracted away. And that, I think... Mm -hmm. Where, where the direction this should go in is that a lot of that work um, ends up falling on wallets, for example, wallets and like the places users tend to enter, the things users tend to interface with, uh, which is basically like wallets, block explorers, you know. Um, in other words, the 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 things users use kind of universally, right? So that a particular DAP doesn't have to always reinvent the wheel. A wallet can do mm, a lot mm -hmm. of the work, uh, right? This is already true of a lot of things. Like, obviously, wallets is what you use to sign transactions. So if I'm a DAP developer, I don't have to worry about that, typically. Um, wallets, like, show your ETH balance. They show your token balance, right? These are just universal things um, that, that wallets handle. So I think if wallets take on more of the heavy lifting of interopping between chains, moving assets between chains, making that UX seamless and kind of just only showing the user what they absolutely need to know, um, then yeah, this increasing complexity under the hood uh, hopefully won't won't matter as much. But um, yeah, that's sort of easy for me to just say, but it's a very difficult problem <laughs> even from, from a from a UX perspective and one that I'm not particularly you know um, I don't have that sort of brain that's good at these UX questions. So um, yeah, this will be this will be an interesting challenge for. Yeah, wallets, and yeah, I, I imagine also also block explorers. I think there's a lot of room there right now. Block explorers kind of just you know, for a given chain, you have a block explorer, and then for a different chain, you have another block explorer. But as chains mm -hmm. interact more and more, there's I can imagine ways of making these interactions more obvious, where where even explorers themselves connect. But yeah, none of these none of these uh, none of these things are easy. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I mean, I you bring up an interesting point that it's kind of a, a problem that everyone has to work together to solve. It's not just, you know, you or Ethereum that has to worry about how to deal with this. Yeah, exactly. So it's an ecosystem-wide yeah. thing. Exactly. And just for, you know, given the stuff that I that I kind of work on and think about, I, I, I think more at the, you know, at the at the protocol design level, like that, that that's its own challenge. But but yeah, equally mm -hmm important is is the you know the higher up parts of the stack and, and and then even in between the like developer tooling and things like that um which that's that's where we have seen some progress um uh is that you know more and more if you're using you know if you're a developer and you're using some library you know it's it's getting more and more easy to sort of if you're building with multiple chains in mind <laughs> libraries are more right. designed for that where it, it, it that, that used to just sort of be an afterthought so so yeah this is this is just kind of the direction i think things are things are going in and and yeah the ecosystem has to has to evolve um on, yeah as you say on many different fronts at once right right and i mean i th i think everyone's pretty open to thinking about this now as you mentioned a lot of protocols are starting to work on this you know how can you um, move liquidity from one chain to another and, and achieve, a, you know, a higher capital efficiency. So. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. I think basically anyone in this space, yeah, from if you're 
a DAP developer, even if you're, you know, layer twos, whatever, all, all, all of the various projects I mentioned, there's sort of an understanding that like, this mm-hmm. is a multi-chain, a multi-chain world. Even if you're like a hardcore Ethereum <laughs> maxi, maxi person, it's like, <laughs> you still have to think in terms of multiple chains because even if you think all those other chains are going to be layer twos of Ethereum, that's still for all intents and purposes, you know, that's its own type of multiple chain world. Um, right, so, right. So, so everything I said still kind of applies. So yeah, everyone's everyone's kind of just accepted that that's the direction things are going, uh, except for maybe some Bitcoiners, but you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> we don't. Yeah, well, that's a whole different <laughs> different topic. <laughs> different Twitter space, yeah. Let's, yeah, let's yeah, totally exactly. Oh, that's funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, with F Maxis at least, I think they understand, or most people understand, you know, Ultimately, Ethereum will just be the settlement layer. You won't be performing any transactions on there. Um, yeah, exactly. At, at the that's, end game. That's, so. Yeah, that's that's you know, there's very little debate about that general idea. That yeah, it's it's the ecosystem looks like you know, most users are transacting on layer twos. You know, the roll up centric roadmap is, a, is, a, is I guess the term that's caught on and and yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, um, so yeah. Cool. So uh, before we jump to what you guys are working on, um, mm-hmm. does that open any – so like layer two to layer two or cross uh, call, um, mm-hmm. you know, communication, things like that, does that open any, I guess, security implications if, you know, something on the, say, Solana network you know, is invalidated or there's a hack over there, that, does that potentially affect you guys if there's these, you know, cross-communication calls or kind of interoperability between, you know, two two networks like that? Yeah. So and how do you kind really, of look at that? Yeah, it's that's sort of the, the it's it's an important question. And, and, and basically, you know, the line for us, given that, you know, Arbitrum Rollup is an Ethereum layer two, kind of full stop, Whatever we're sort of thinking about or designing, you know, when you're thinking about interop and bridging and things like that, at a pro, you know, what we what we don't want and we can't have is to have sort of the security of Arbitrum or Arbitrum One, let's just say, um, the Arbitrum rollup chain. We can't have that security be tethered to the security of any other chain other than Ethereum itself, right? So if we come up with some cool design that says, okay, this is really convenient and nice for users, but um, but, you know, that lets us, uh, I don't know, um, you know, like, well, so like one thing that we've that we've been thinking about is how can we improve cross-chain communication between Arbitrum Run and Arbitrum Nova, our two chains, right? It's a very natural thing to, um, to think about. What we can't have is a situation where we say, okay, this is a great design, it's really convenient, but if Arbitrum Nova gets compromised, it also hurts Arbitrum One, <laughs> um, right? So we can't, we can't sort of, mm-hmm. um, any decision we make can't reduce that core security assumption. And um, so what that means is, yeah, there's, 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 there's things we can do, but the moment um, if you're introducing any sort of risk like that, um, that's something that, you know, can and is the case with all sorts of applications because, you know, people can build whatever they want and people can use whatever they want. Um, we, just, we just can't wire it, in, wire it into the protocol. So, you know, for example, um, uh, I, I don't want to name any specific ones in case I have said anything wrong, but there's, you know, there's plenty of bridges out there where, where those sort of risks apply, where maybe it's a, you know, it's a bridge that exists on these, you know, half a dozen chains. And if you sort of look at the details, you realize that, okay, if, if, if one chain's security gets compromised, it sort of compromises the bridge itself. And now, you know, I might be able to sort of, uh, you know, mint tokens through the bridge on some other chain, right? That kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. so yeah, those, that's, that's one of the tricky risks to suss out with these bridges, I would just say. Uh, and, and yeah, it's kind of a complicated topic, but on our end for our core protocol stuff, we just want to make sure that whatever we introduce doesn't, uh, doesn't change our core security assumptions is, is basically the idea. Gotcha. Gotcha. So security comes first. Yeah. Security comes first. And, and yeah, even if, if we want to introduce any other stuff, it just has to be, has to have a clear separation of this is a particular application that some other team built, or maybe, maybe even we help build them, but it doesn't affect like users of Arbitrum one, uh, you know, who bridge mm-hmm. through through our canonical bridge and have that token representation that has to be just sort of purely Ethereum derived security is is the um, the starting point. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Um, okay. Cool. So that's the future of interoperability. That's how you guys fit into Ethereum. I think that's uh, that makes sense. 
Um, so what do you guys have uh, up and coming that's uh, exciting? Um, can you maybe share the development roadmap for the next year or? Yeah, for sure. So one thing, um, so there's, there's a number of things that we're gonna, we haven't quite talked about yet that we'll be announcing very soon. So um, definitely keep, um, keep an eye on that. Um, and a lot of these things, uh, well, I'll talk about one, one in particular. So I, I alluded to a few times that, you know, um, we, we have this system um, that's fully implemented uh, um, of, uh, of validators who can participate in these disputes, but it's currently on a whitelist. Um, and part of the reason that we've so far maintained, so obviously this whitelist has to, is, you know, was always meant to be temporary. <clears throat> you know, we wouldn't have built this whole system if we were just gonna, if we were just going to whitelist it. And part of the reason we've maintained that is um, there's kind of a, a new version of our, what we call our challenge protocol that we're gonna be shipping. Um, and it, it uh, improves on a certain property, uh, which I guess I can, I can briefly try to describe it, but I would say if, if you're really interested in the details, um, if you look at our blog, um, Ed Felton, one of the founders and our chief scientist, wrote a nice blog post really um, sort of outlining this problem or this challenge in detail, which is essentially that, um, I guess the, the quickest way I can explain it is that, like I said, you know, the Arbitrum system involves this notion of disputes, right? Um, so, so happy case, common case, you, you, uh, there's a, a claim made about Arbitrum and one week later, it just gets finalized on Ethereum. Um, if somebody wants to, they can challenge it and we're guaranteed that the sort of the honest party will always end up winning. The issue comes up is, uh, there's this notion of delay attacks, which kind of has to do with, if you imagine some attacker just kind of keeps on challenging again and again and again, um, and just keeps, uh, they can, in the worst case scenario, they can do it in such a way that they only like each of their challenges only gets knocked off one by one. So what this amounts to is they can sort of delay confirmation, which the way this would affect users and so on is this means, you know, users who are trying to withdraw would have to wait longer than a week. Right. Um, mm -hmm. To be honest, it's, it's, it would very, even in that case, they could still use the fast bridges. Right. So it's really mostly affecting like liquidity providers. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a pretty narrow sort of attack. And also, again, in order to do this attack, it would be very costly because every, in order to buy this time, to buy this delay time, you have to keep losing challenges and you have to keep getting some stakes slash. So, um, but, you know, we take, you know, we take security and things like this very seriously. So um, we, um, um, we want to sort of uh, minimize or even eliminate that particular um, delay attack vector. Um, and basically we have a design, we have a, a new design that does that. So it's, it's very similar to our current challenge system on a, on a high level. It's the same kind of basic idea, but the details are different such that in this new system, we can give a tight upper bound on how long any, any sort of challenge process could take. Basically, basically at worst, it takes like two weeks or like three weeks from the initial thing, something like that. So, um, so the delay attack thing is eliminated. Um, and then with that, um, you know, once that shipped, uh, again, that's the, that was the main reason we kept this whitelist up is we didn't want something like this to happen. Um, at that point, you know, we'll be, we'll be in a position where we can, where we can remove that whitelist. So, um, yeah, the details there, again, you can, you can look at the blog post for the details of the delay attack, the details of the new spec will, um, and, and the implementation itself will be coming out soon. Um, but that's a sort of a wonky development, but the, I think the exciting part is it's a, it's a, it's a crucial step towards, you know, it's a crucial piece of, uh, of progressive decentralization. Um, other stuff that, yeah, I can't quite talk about, but there's other kind of important pieces of progressive decentralization that we'll have more to say about soon. Um, and then, yeah, I think probably this week, there's another announcement, something we totally haven't talked about, which isn't really about decentralization, but it has to do with kind of improving the capabilities of Arbitrum, uh, which I'll, I'll speak very vaguely about because um, I don't want to, you know, front run our announcement. But I can just say that... Um, there's this cool property, uh, and this gets a bit wonky, so excuse me, but th there's a, a, a cool property of Arbitrum is that the way that we get, the particular way that we get Ethereum compatibility um, and the way that we kind of prove fraud has to do with uh, compiling down to this, this, this machine representation called WASM. And this is a nice design for a lot of reasons, and it, and it means that, okay, we can, we can, we're compatible with, with the EVM itself. But it turns out that with this architecture, not only can we be compatible with the EVM, we can actually sort of add additional functionality. Um, so uh, in principle, right, we can, we can use this proving system to do things that you actually can't even, you know, beyond what you can do on Ethereum from a development perspective. Um, 
and um, yeah, I'll probably just, uh, I don't want to say too much, so I'll, I'll stop there, but keep on the lookout for that. Um, hmm. This is a, a really cool, uh, yeah, little kind of um, um, technical initiative that we've been working on and are very excited to start start being more public about. Uh, yeah. Oh, interesting. I wish I could say more about a number of these things, but there's, there's a number <laughs> of, there's at least one concrete thing and then a few teasers, so hopefully that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no uh, alpha leak. So <laughs> alpha leak. There you go. Yeah, uh, it sounds interesting though. Like there might be some compatibility with you know, say Cosmos or Polkadot or some options there. Yeah, that you're. If you if you know about Polkadot, that's maybe a. It's sort of a maybe a good hint. <laughs> if you know about how Polkadot works, <laughs> but let's just say yeah, it's it's you know we we can still preserve from like a smart contract perspective, if you're a Solidity developer or a Viper developer and all that, none of that changes. We still get full Ethereum mm. compatibility. But um, but yeah, the the sort of underlying virtual machine proving architecture is such that we can we can include more um, um, in that. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Cool, no, appreciate that. Thank you for the, the alpha. Mm -hmm. um, so just to kind of jump back maybe a little bit and talk about um, you know, these other optimistic role networks, do you guys like mm -hmm. converse with them and kind of discuss like overarching, you know, developments together or do you see them straight strictly as competitors or how do the other, um, networks kind of fit into what you're doing and how you're trying to expand and build? Yeah. You know, it's, um, to be honest, it, you know, it can it, it can be a bit tricky for sort of the reason you're implying, which is, you know, in some sense, of course, we're literally competitors at the same time we're you know, a we're like literally friendly with a lot of them as people, um, the people, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. the people working on other L2s. And of course, like, you know, we're working on very similar things and, and we're all sort of in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, there can, it can be hard to know sort of where those where those lines are. What I would say, though, is, you know, there's a number of things um, uh, we certainly keep in communication um, and and try to sort of like at least communicate and if possible coordinate on standards where possible. Um, anyone who's worked in this space or probably like in tech at all knows that coordinating on standards is like never really works, but it's at least like, you know, it's just a very hard thing to do and to get people to agree and, 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 and all of that. Mm -hmm. But at, at least like making sure those lines of communication are open and, and sort of comparing notes as we run into similar problems is, um, is something we try to do. Um, one thing that, um, can just shout out the Ethereum Alliance has started this nice initiative, sort of like a, um, uh, we call it like the cross chain interop group. Um, and you can, you know, that's all the stuff, you know, the discussions we have there and the output of that is all, is all public on GitHub, um, which is, which is, yeah, that's been helpful. So that's just, we, we, we sort of keep in touch there and it's various, um, various things that are nice to standardize on when, you know, and different L2s join and have their inputs and, and, and things like that. So yeah, initiatives right. there from like additional parties is, um, are, are very helpful, but yeah, again, the fact that we're competitors means it's, it's, it's hard to know how much is the right amount to, to be, you know, in, in contact and sharing stuff. And, and honestly, even more so I think than the fact that we're competitors, it's like, you know, this is, we're all working on hard stuff. We all have, you know, we're all at capacity in terms of what we're doing. And it's like, uh, the additional overhead of const of trying to coordinate is is just difficult. Um, right. So um, so yeah, in practice, a lot of things just kind of just kind of happen, and then we compare notes after the fact. But um, yeah, I think with the EA Alliance stuff, we are we are getting better. I mean, one thing I won't maybe won't try to fully describe it because it's it's a bit in the weeds. But there's this notion of like address aliasing that we introduced um, uh, when we launched Arbitrum. That's just a necessary piece of cross chain communication. Um, yeah, we're working to sort of generalize that and make it more standard. Where where I think Optimism already is 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 doing uh, using the same the same schema and hopefully ideally you know as more and more layer twos emerge and run into the same uh, you know the same the same problem or the same thing. It's like oh okay this this standard exists we can just use it and that'll just make mm -hmm. everyone's life easier you know for uh, who's who's in the ecosystem. So yeah, I do think we're improving. To, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's certain things that are good to standardize and some things that are good to keep private. And, you know, even if two networks are working on the same thing, one might emerge as a better, you know, coding or thought process than the other one. And it works out better for any, everyone at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Yeah. Than exactly. to just and, say collude and, you know, say like you guys do that and then you come up with it and it's maybe not as efficient as it could be. Yeah. That's the other thing, you know, there's also just different, 
thinking you know we sort of have different mm -hmm. approaches and different philosophy and that's and that's and that's fine you know that's good in fact that there's like you know that's the sort of healthy side of competition right you get you get different options right. and you see what works so um uh yeah so i think it's uh overall you know i think it's there's there's been a few like uh there's, th th there's been a few misfires of coordination and communication there where oh okay if we had all just agreed on this semi-arbitrary thing earlier it would have it would have been nicer for everyone <laughs> but um there's, it's definitely happened some you know in some cases maybe even literally my fault but, um, but, but, uh, but overall we're getting it's tough though right yeah. like where do you delineate yeah. right it's but yeah it's, yeah it's, it's i, I thought i would just see if there was a like a committee, I guess, for overseeing, you know, standardization, but it sounds like you guys are, are working towards that or there is a group there. So yeah, the AIDA, the AIDA uh, thing maybe is, you know, yeah, there's no, there, there's no one thing, but that's, that's probably the closest thing. That's at least an, an mm -hmm. initiative to help, to help track, you know, what are the open questions and what are, what are the various teams doing to tackle them? So yeah, I think that's, that's a very positive development. Cool. Cool. So, uh, we got two questions left and I think we can wrap it up here. So, um, mm -hmm. I guess we'll just briefly talk on uh, EIP four eight eight or four eight four four and how that got sure. how that is going to help to scale you guys. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, in short, um, so this is um, EIP four eight four four. In terms of uh, the net result it will have, in terms of what users will experience, this will uh, we expect will mean much lower fees on basically on Ethereum rollups across the board. So which of course includes Arbitrum, but it's, should e should be equally helpful to um, um, to any other rollup project. Um, the basic idea here is so first of all, yeah, like I said, when you're using an Ethereum rollup, the the you you know as of now, probably the primary cost you're paying as a user is for storing data on layer one. Um, so EIP four eight four four is introduced. It sort of introduces a new data type that can be cheaper. That can be a lot cheaper. Um, I guess to um, um, to go into it a bit. So the way rollups work now is the, the sort of the way they use Ethereum. The thing that they need from Ethereum is that you need to um, use Ethereum strictly as a data availability layer. So we use it. You know, we use it for the fraud proof system, like I said, if need be. But in the normal happy case, it's just there for data availability. So you you sort of post data on Ethereum, but you post it in such a way that. Um, as long as it's there, as long as nodes can download it, you know you're good, and you get you, you get the properties you want. You don't, mm -hmm. for example, need need this data um, to be accessible by other smart contracts on Ethereum. So um, the distinction here, current the only distinction that it, the only way to make that distinction now on Ethereum is you can either, um, if you're sort of like calling a smart contract with some data, you can store it in the Ethereum state, and if it's in the Ethereum state, in you know. Uh, uh, state is sort of a hard thing to define because it's sort of circular, but it's like all of, you know, all of the account balances, all of the contracts, all of the bytecode there, everything about Ethereum at a given time is in the state. Um, storing something in Ethereum state is much more expensive because it has to be sort of accessible to other smart contracts. With rollups to do this, to just use this data for data availability, they use what's called call data. Um, and using call data this way, it's funny. This is what, this is just the natural thing for all rollups to do and that's what they do, but it's, it's kind of a hack. Um, call data isn't really meant to be used this way. It's just that this is this is what's available. So mm. the the thinking of four eight four four is like okay, since increasingly um, so much of Ethereum activity, you know, is, is so much of the activity is taking place on rollups, and that you know what we sort of expect and want to see is that you know virtually all of the activity takes place on rollups. Instead of just sort of using call data in this you know what I'm calling a hacky way, let's introduce a new data type for this exact purpose. Um, so mm -hmm. I think we're calling it like blob data, um, but it's essentially with, with 4844, transactions can post this data that inherently cannot affect the Ethereum state. Okay, so it's sort of designed for the specific purpose. It's just there, it gets propagated to other nodes, um, but it can affect Ethereum state. And then we can also do things like this data can have its own sort of um, dimension of pricing, right? So. We, we we sort of we're sort of optimizing for the use case of just using it just using uh, the base layer for data availability, which yeah primarily will benefit rollups, probably also some other applications um, that are doing similar things. Mm -hmm. But the primary purpose is um, is for is for rollups there. So um, so yeah so that's the that, that's the initial step is just having this new data type, 
And yeah, we optimize again, it has its own pricing mechanism. We know that it can't touch state, so therefore it can be cheaper. Also, we can sort of set these rules that nodes have to sort of like download it and propagate it, but they don't need to keep it forever. There's like a 30 day timeout period. So the idea is, you know, roll up projects using this data, you can download it and do what you want with it. But then Ethereum full nodes don't have to keep it forever. So that's like a nice economic optimization there. So um, yeah, for various reasons, mm -hmm. this, this data can and should be cheaper than call data, um, uh, which is nice. And this also kind of sets the groundwork for further improvements down the line, things like sharding, which maybe I won't, I won't get into. So um, yeah, I think it's something, it's, it's, um, I, have to, I, have to, I have to draw the line somewhere. So um, it's, it's certainly something we, that, that we've supported for a while and seems to at this point have, have pretty broad support um, um, in the Ethereum ecosystem. It's on the Ethereum roadmap. Um, and yeah, I should say that uh, uh, we, uh, meaning off-chain labs, uh, the company behind Arbitrum, um, a few months ago, we acquired Prism, um, the Ethereum layer one client, one of the major Ethereum layer one consensus clients. Um, and mm -hmm. they're, yeah, they're one of the lead, you know, designers and implementers of, of 4844. So, uh, yeah, they're working under the, uh, under the off-chain labs banner now. And, uh, yeah, we're happy to be sort of supporting them in that. Awesome. Awesome. Um, do you have any insight on when that's expected to kind of go live or? Um, I don't know about dates, but I know that, you know, what they're, what the client teams are, uh, what the consensus client teams are currently working on are, you know, the, the big priorities are 4844 and, uh, withdrawals of stake. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, uh, yeah, exactly where things have landed right now in terms of the timeline. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know the latest, but it's, you know, it is of the two top priorities for sure. So, um, gotcha. and, and, I, and I, can, I mean, I can also just tell you that in terms of these implementations are, are very far along the actual implementations, but, um, mm -hmm. yeah, at what point, at what point, you know, everyone decides we're ready and, and then things are safe enough is, is, is its own question, but uh, right. it's certainly coming along and yeah, it's, it's, it's happening. It's going to happen. So it's exciting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, some of these things take time with Ethereum, that's for sure. But when it comes out, it's usually, you know, very well thought out and, uh, you know, there's no, no, bugs hopefully and everything works works great usually so yeah exactly exactly and uh you know we've seen yeah the merge is obviously one example where there was a lot of uh yeah. it took a while to get there and, and various false starts <laughs> but i think ultimately you know we did get there and and yeah those false starts involve um you know really really thinking through problems and 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 you know making sure everything checks out and is secure and and um you know throwing out designs that are unnecessarily complex and things like that and i actually think in a way, you know, what you, what, you know, with the merge, that was a lot of the like proof of stake ideas and design and research converged on like, okay, this is the, the best, simplest first step. Um, was mm -hmm. what we ended up seeing with the merge. I would say in some sense, a lot of what we saw from the, the line of research around Ethereum sharding has kind of led to 4844 as this is, um, the natural, uh, first step that itself is beneficial, um, and will sort of at least set the groundwork to, for something a lot like sharding or what was once discussed that way. So, um, so yeah, right. that's, that's, um, that's just kind of, kind of how Ethereum does it. But, but yeah, it's good that again, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't some hypothetical research project and, you know, same with the merge as we saw it actually happen. This is, people are really building this. It's going to happen. Uh, there's no sort of unsolved problems here. Uh, right. So, so yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good thing to see. And I mean, to be fair, there's a lot of, you know, money or effort involved in this. So it's not uh, something you, you want to take lightly when you're upgrading uh, Ethereum. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, going going relatively slower is, is yeah, is, is a positive thing. Of course, people... Yeah, there's never a bad thing with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unless you're going too slow like Bitcoin. But again, that's another, uh, another space <laughs> maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, okay, so we'll jump in quick. Uh, any protocol launches that you're most excited about, I guess, besides Fru Combo? <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, so be, just speaking personally, I've definitely been following Celestia for a while. Um, mm. And I'm very mm -hmm. interested in, yeah, excited for that and interested in seeing how that, how that plays out. Uh, full disclosure, I know John Adler, one of the creators, and like him as a person, so I'm biased there. But I do think um, it is... Um, 
Yeah, it's, it's certainly one of the more interesting and innovative layer ones in a very long time, you know, to be, you know, frankly, when new layer ones emerge, it's, it's, it's nothing too interesting or exciting typically, but this is one that's mm -hmm. actually doing something different and serving an interesting purpose. So um, that's probably the thing I'm, I'm, I'm most uh, excited to see. Um, more, more generally, with, without mentioning specific projects, but a lot of the, um, some of the sort of like zero knowledge proving research or, or you know validity proof research in bridging is pretty interesting. Mm. Um, that that that's sort of an exciting space of like you know zk bridges of validating one chain, you know validating what's going on on one chain on another chain um, and how that can sort of improve bridges is is cool. Um, it's fairly complex and it's also not a silver bullet, but um, I think the more that stuff comes out, that'll be like a really useful primitive that that uh, various protocols can use. So yeah, and some of the stuff I have mapped out. Cool. Yeah. No, those are uh, interesting developments for sure. Um, yeah. So I think uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask to come up to speak or post it on the Twitter space here, and we'll get to the question. Um, but thank you very much, Daniel, for being here and, and uh, going through these questions. I think we, we covered quite a bit. Um, and feel free to shout out your, uh, your Twitter again so people can follow you. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, thanks for having <laughs> me. This was, this was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, my actual Twitter account is at dzak23. Once I'm allowed to log in again, I will continue to tweet from there. So <laughs> feel free to follow me there. Uh, and this account too, yeah, the Arbitrum Devs, I should say, this is sort of... Um, if you're, if, you know, if you're a developer, tech researcher, that sort of thing, this is where we post the more technical updates. Um, and then um, at Arbitrum, the, um, uh, just the at Arbitrum account is where you'll get sort of broader ecosystem partnership announcement type updates. Um, and for more information generally, I think the our docs, developer.arbitrum.io, if you want more, in, more info on some of the various stuff I talked about, that's a good, a good place to just start. Perfect, perfect. And again, if you haven't uh, visited for your combo, definitely check that out as well. Um, we have some interesting tooling uh, that you can use for managing your DeFi and liquidity on Aave. Things like flash loans where you can unlock even additional capabilities that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So check that out if you haven't and let us know if you have any questions. And again, thank you everyone for taking the time to be here. And thank you, Daniel. It was an awesome chat. Cool. Thanks again. Take care. Yeah, it doesn't look like we have any questions, so we'll uh, we'll end it here. Thanks very much again. Cheers. Cheers.